Hi everyone. Uh, wanted to walk through a uh, an example problem uh, for coil springs. So in the the diagram I have shown here in this example, um, we have two springs. So an inner spring and an outer spring, uh, which I'm sure you can tell by my array of dots on the screen, array of little circles. Um, and we're going to assume they're both made out of steel. Uh, they're both the same length. Uh, one is just nested inside the other. So the smaller one is nested inside the larger. And we have the, the criteria given there that the outer diameter, uh, major diameter is 50 millimeters, wire diameter of the outer spring is nine millimeters, and there are five turns of the spring. For the inner spring, its major diameter is 30 millimeters, wire diameter is five millimeters, and it has 10 turns um, in this case. So we're going to assume that, again, they're the same length, both made out of steel, um, there, the end plates on them that the, you know, the support would be set on and that you know, rest on the table or whatever it is um, are fully in contact. So there's no weird, uh, no weird stresses going on. And we want to figure out you know, how much deflection we're going to get by setting a weight um, on this, this pair of springs together. Uh, and that weight that we're going to apply up here is going to be three kilonewtons and how much stress we could expect to find um, in the springs when we do that uh, and you know we, we can't necessarily assume that those are the same uh, the same so first step might be to to go ahead and find the spring constant for each of these so we have an equation for the spring constant that looks something like this d to the fourth g over 8 d to the third n and if we take g for um, just a, a generic steel um, we can look up in the book or we can look up online but uh, a good number that we might use would be um, 79 gigapascals which would be 79 times 10 to the ninth pascals and then we can calculate our spring constant. Now, because we have the diameters in here and the number of turns, we can see that the spring constant isn't going to be the same for each one. So we need to calculate the spring constant or spring rate uh, for them individually. So starting with the outer, we have nine millimeters to the fourth times uh, let's see, units, we need to, so I've got this one in millimeters. Um, we can do gigapascals in uh, millimeters if we want to, um, just recognizing that basically one megapascal is a newton per millimeter squared. So converting that to gigapascals, we'd have 79,000 newtons per millimeter squared. Um, let's see, divided by eight times 50 millimeters to the third times five turns. And if we calculate this out, we get 103.66 newtons per millimeter. Great, so that effectively means that um, to compress this spring by one millimeter, it, it would take uh, 103 and two thirds uh, newtons to do that. And we can do the same thing to the inner spring. So these are basically treating the springs uh, independently. Sorry, I'm writing my units a little sloppy here. That squiggly line is millimeters. And I get a spring rate of 22.86. Newtons per millimeter. So our smaller uh, inner spring we can see has a lower spring rate. Uh, we would probably expect that, right? The larger size, larger wire diameter of the outer spring um, would lead us to expect that the 
um, outer larger spring is going to be stiffer. All right. So, so far we know force applied and we know uh, spring rate. And that kind of leads us um, to use the uh, calculation, which we know F equals K delta, which is to say that um, given a spring rate of newtons per millimeter times some deflection millimeters, we get force, um, which of course we could rearrange this since we know K and we know F, we rearrange this to solve for delta as F over K. Now, what do we do with the fact that we have two different values of K? Well, we need to kind of think about what's happening, right? We have these two springs acting together, right? And if I apply a load uniformly to the two of them, I don't have a way to represent two springs, but if I apply a load uniformly to the two of them, they're both gonna push back, right, with some force. Um, in opposition to the force we apply and the amount at which they push back is going to be proportional to their spring rate so we can assume that they will both contribute to that force uh, uh, pushing back such that we get um, this force of 3,000 newtons divided by two forces pushing back due to that spring rate, so 103.66 plus 22.86, um, since they're both contributing to that. And that's in newtons per millimeter. Newtons over newtons cancel. One over millimeters becomes millimeters, or one over one over millimeters becomes just millimeters, uh, and we get a deflection of 23.71 millimeters. Great. So we know, you know, applying this load of, of um, three kilonewtons, we're going to compress this by uh, 23.7 millimeters in theory. Now this is, this is an overall force applied to the whole thing. And uh, something that might be a little confusing, but if you think about, um, let me, let me kind of, backtrack a little bit here if I pull this this I just drew this top plate as a line right but let's pretend it's you know more of an actual plate and I have on one side my three kilonewton load on the other side I have and you know I'd normally apply my my spring loads right in the middle assuming uniformity but let's say I have one fo and an Fi both applied at the same, more or less the same point. And both of those forces are opposing this oppos this 3000 kilonewtons. So they're not necessarily equal, right? They don't have to be equal. And we actually wouldn't expect them to be equal, right? Because we know our deflection and we can see that the spring rates are different for each spring. And therefore we'd expect this load to be taken up proportional to their stiffness, right? So what that means is we can calculate FO and FI now using this same equation, but now saying KO delta and KI delta. So where before we were putting the Ks together into a, a um, cumulative stiffness of the two springs together, now we're separating them out. And saying, well, how much force does each spring contribute? So if I start with uh, KO, I have 103.66 newtons per millimeter times 23.71 millimeters equals 2,458 newtons. And for the inner spring, I have 22.86 and I get 542 and as we would expect these two add together to balance that 3,000 kilonewtons right it's it's just a proportionality how much of that 3,000 newton applied load needs to be taken up um, by each spring Great. So, 
scroll down so we can keep moving. We've got these forces, and now the next thing we want to know is, well, what, what kind of stress can we expect from this? And we had um, an equation for stress, and that is tau equals 8 FD over pi d cubed and times some k value, a different k than what we were just talking about. Um, this is the, the correction factor um, because of the, the, the torsional stress. And we're using the static form for that uh, that we talked about before rather than the dynamic because we're assuming the load is just applied statically. And therefore we can, we can substitute what we know into that equation uh, in order to solve. Now, first we need to grab the equation for Ks. If I go up here, I can see Ks equals one plus 0.5 over C and C equals big D over little d. So for the inner and the outer, where did my pen go? There we are. C outer equals 50 over 9, which equals 5.56. C inner equals 30 over 5, which equals 6. So that's our, our spring index. And then we have from that, k outer equals 1 plus, oops, 0 0.5 over 5.56, which equals 1.09. And k, oops, this is s outer k s inner equals 1 plus 0 0.5 over 6 which equals roughly 1.08. Great. So I've got those values. Now I can plug everything in. Tau outer equals 8 times the force taken up by that spring times the diameter pi times 9 cubed times 1.09 equals 467.9 for megapascals. And do the same thing for the inner. And I get 8 times 542 times 30 over pi times 5 cubed times 1.08. 357.75 megapascals. So I get stresses uh, in each of those springs. And great, that's what the problem looked for. Um, if we were to keep going with this, uh, what we would do is take those stresses and compare them uh, against our, our stress limits. Um, typically we might care, uh, compare them against our yield strength or our, or our ultimate strength, um, allowing for a clash limit. So trying to avoid, um, you know, spring solid, uh, situation and, and what that would, um, the failure that that would cause. Uh, but this is where we're taking this problem is basically how much stress we, we expect to find. So I'll stop there. Thanks.